You're listening to Bedroom Beethoven's, where notable music makers break down stories accompanied by songs and melodies documenting growth through their 10,000 hour journey. And me? Well, my name is Cello, your host. Beethoven. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome to episode 142 of the podcast. I love you and all my heart and soul. My guest this week is uh, it's Calvin Valentine. Shit, I'm music producer, musician, rapper, singer, all that shit. Yeah, you know, I produced for some folks, did Dilla J's last two albums, De La Soul, Nas, Juicy J, Bun B, I don't know, man, the list goes on. AKA Cal VP, AKA <laughs> yeah, Bong G-Force, Mayor. Bong Mayor, Cal yeah. Valvinus. Um, <laughs> Cal Valvinus, that's a good one, yep. <laughs> Man, you hear that resume? Nas, De La Soul. This goes on and on. Calvin ain't nothing to play with. And we talk about his career from Warp Tour to the days of Portland and LA, expectations within music and how he's breaking down barriers. How, you ask? Well, when making his new project, Weed is Awesome, Calvin smoked all the weed and wanted you to experience the record the same way. This is the first time an artist has ever shipped weed with his music, and he's on the show this week. But before we get to that, please go check out BedroomBeethovens.com and smash that like button and subscribe. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, but that's what everyone says. It's super annoying. All I want you to do is give me some money, man. Patreon.com slash BedroomBeethovens. Keep this passion project going. You know, Go look at the show notes, click the link, or head to the website. A buck or two gets you access to interviews a few days early, and it helps me out keeps the show ad free as well so sit back with a selection of fine herbal enhancement and enjoy this conversation with the great and powerful calvin valentine he lit up this weed and i got so fucking high i had never been that high in my life you know i got a bone to pick with you man we, we met we coordinated the time we met you showed up then you rescheduled and then you ghosted me, man. I never heard back from you. You hurt my feelings. I don't remember that. <laughs> Is that when I couldn't get the like mic situation set up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's why I ghosted you because I didn't get the mic situation set up. <laughs> there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> well, it's a, uh, it's a momentous. It, it was going to be a momentous day to rekindle our friendship because yesterday was Illa J's birthday, so it was going to come full circle. I did. I did an episode with him last month. He's in. He's in high spirits, and he speaks very, very highly of you. That's my daughter. It's like one of my best friends, man. We talk like every day and shit. But true, true to form, man. Are, are you? Are you relaxed? Are you high right now? No, no. It's way too early in the morning for me. I'm not a waker and baker. I, as of late, I haven't given much thought to whether or not my guests are high. But I had on Asher Roth last month, and someone wrote into me. And said, man, I hang out with that guy on the daily. Why would you let him ramble on and on and go on a high rant? And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know he was high. I don't know the guy, but I thought yeah. the things that he said were interesting. So I'm, I'm trying to yeah. gauge of how people are. So no, no, I mean, I would, I would be if it, I don't really smoke weed until I don't even know, like two, three p.m. is usually when I start getting stoned, just because like. I'm not much of a morning person. So if I start smoking this like at 10, 8, and 9 in the morning, whenever I wake up, game over. My day's done. So I, I am surprised that you're still in LA because I, I just thought, you know, with, with the COVID and, and everybody not really getting, you know, in close proximity, if you didn't have to pay the, the, the LA rent or that California rent, you know, I thought maybe you would go back. But I guess, you know, the, the seven years ago, the sweet potato pie closed, and maybe it just hasn't been the same there since. <laughs> Definitely, man. I still got my bond from sweet potato pie for sure. But yeah, no, nah, I mean, like, I like my situation in, in Los Angeles and um, definitely have moments where I, I wanted to go back just to be 
closer to family and shit, but um, yeah, it just didn't make any sense to be honest. It's like that was just felt like going backwards. Well, that's what's up, man. Because you know, when I do a, a retrospective of your career, it, it is pretty crazy. You know, I had on Braille two weeks ago, and oh, we wow. talked. Yeah, we talked about native lungs, and you're you were freaking on it. I didn't even know that when I talked to him. And then mm-hmm. eighteen months later, you're producing a song, and and Bun B's on it, and it just you know, I think the biggest compliment I can afford you is you can produce for any damn body. It's almost like you have a beat in mind for the artist ahead of time. I'd like to say I try to be do that, but I just get bored with styles. You know, it's like. I'll chop records and do some soul sample shit and I'll get tired of that. I'll make like 20, 30 beats of that. And then I'll move on to something else. And I kind of just like move in cycles by doing that. Then I'm able to have a beat ready for whatever artist I'm working with and, or like have the skill set to create something from scratch in front of whatever artist I'm working with. So that just had to do with my, like, you know, I just get I, bored. I, I think that Bun B album, that, that song is slept on. I think there's only like 12,000 views on YouTube. It's criminal. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's a. Uh, it's funny too. I just like I had some homies over. We were working on some music, and they're like young, young dudes, um, and so they like don't know anything about that era of my career and shit. And I like told them about the Bun B video and that whole thing. And they're like, "Oh, we got to see this," and I pulled it up, and I think they were like ready to hate. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "Damn, this shit kind of tight." And I'm like, "Yep," because I was like, "Oh, I'm singing on the hook," and they're like, "Wait, you sing?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, I can sing and shit." And then. It was hella funny though. But yeah, that, that song still kind of goes, but you know, you can have the Bun B feature in the video, but you, it's marketing, you know, a lot of that shit, especially back then. It was a lot about blog placements and stuff. And the artists who put that song out, uh, it was tough, you know, it's tough to like to figure out how to actually promote music. It's it's just weird because I'm from Texas. So when you say Bun B, like mm-hmm. I, I know the I know the rap sheet. Ever, ever since Pimp C died, I see his career. It doesn't really make much sense. Like he just created, he created an album with like Static Select and you would never think that yeah. Bun B over Static Beats would work, but it kind of does. And I don't know. I, I I listened to that that song yesterday and I was like, this is just so freaking slept on. And <laughs> I don't know, man. And Braille's a pastor now. So I bet it would be kind of awkward to smoke weed around him now. Yeah. I mean, I, don't rem- I remember our studio session. He came to my like basement studio when I lived in Portland and and I was like super into Ryan Leslie at the time. And so that was kind of like my Ryan Leslie beat for Braille. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was like playing the live drums, playing all the instruments and shit. And I don't remember if I smoked weed around him. I don't know. I was probably respectful of his uh, lifestyle. Probably not. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot more creatives in, in Oregon than I thought, you know, um, uh, yeah, I was, you know, I was going way back. So the old Penny Love videos, uh, correct me if I'm right. I think his name is Efe Adaniji. Efe, yeah. Efe. Mm-hmm. Man, and he's gone on to work with like Snoop Dogg and a bunch of others. And like you guys shot the video at Planet Asia. And I know you guys are still, you know, working together. So, I mean, it's it's really awesome to kind of see that trajectory too. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty amazing. Like, uh, that's another one of like my best friends. And he... He reached out to me when I put out like that. My first like solo album is Calvin Valentine, like the Valentine's Day project. And he was like, yo, I want to like shoot a music video for you. Um, and he he was like, I'm going to I'm about to go out to L.A. to shoot with Kendrick Lamar. And when I come back, like, let's shoot. And uh, so I got all stoked. I'm like, oh, this dude must be killing it. And, and then we shot some videos. And like years later, he told me he's like, I never was going out to shoot a video with Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> <laughs> we all have the same sense of humor so i think it's a lot to do with that and uh that we all had the same goal mm. as we were children we always wanted to be one day famous 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 <laughs> but uh yeah if they you know he's it's, it's been a wild to see where he's gone like when i met him he didn't it, he was in such the beginning stages like we were both putting each other on to different things and i was teaching him about video stuff and putting him on the music videos and movies that i loved and it's just crazy to see he took that shit and ran with it you know it's nuts and he still lives in eugene yeah he's he's the king of eugene like he's got a whole compound in eugene where people fly in he got a recording studio he got the place to shoot um music videos he throws events there like when i put out or when eris put out my album eugene we did a release party at his his studio and a little like you know my brother dj and, and uh 
It was dope, man. Yeah, so he's, he's killing it. He's killing it. It was so successful. Everyone wants success in their career. But when you get there, it's like, no. can we do it again, 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 again and can we better it? Better it? So in the in the town of Eugene, you were you were doing music at six. What are we talking about specifically around that time? Is it is it mostly drumming? Yeah, I was playing drums, and then my buddy Nick, he was he uh, started playing the bass, and then we got into this music program a few years later. Can't fucking remember the name of it, but um, yeah, that's when I like my first performance at like the venue called Wow Hall, which is like my favorite spot in Eugene. Like I got a picture of me playing drums at the Wow Hall when I was like seven or eight. And so, yeah, it started out like that with me and me and Nick kind of jamming him on the bass and me on the drums. Um, and we always loved hip hop and like rock music and all, all sorts of kind of genres. And then, yeah, that's kind of transitioned to hip hop around like 10 years old when we started like doing music production and shit and you know, rapping. Are you are you related to anybody named Cynthia? Mm, no. No, so it, it, it's really weird. This has to be the biggest coincidence in the world, then, because you you drummed at Wow Hall, and now mm-hmm. there's someone named Cynthia Valentine who teaches a dance class at Wow Hall. That's crazy. Let's go. So, so there's other Valentines in Eugene, Oregon. There sure is. That's wild. Yeah, and my uh, my pops, his his best friend Alito, is like a world class dancer, and there's pictures of of them like dancing at the Wow Hall in the '70s and shit when it first opened. So Wow Hall's got a lot of history and like done shows with planet asia there zion i just countless amounts of people we've like opened for or like thrown shows with and yeah man i just love the wild hall like anytime i can go there and, and rock a show i'm like always down so you, you're drumming you have all of these different genres that you kind of like do you have fond memories when you're when you're in the bohemian dub rock band like stuff like that in the early early careers Is that, when yeah, you look yeah. back on that it, it's good memories Hell yeah, the medium Troy days for sure, you know. So it's like 10 years old, started making beats with Hip Hop EJ and, and me and Nick would rap and my brother Sally would scratch and that became like this group called the Alliance or the Alliance Crew. And we would, would we were doing shows. We like did our eighth grade graduation, all this shit. And through that time, I became friends with this dude, Jesse and his older brother, Jojo. And Jesse plays the bass. Jojo like makes beats, sings, plays guitar. And that kind of became medium Troy. Flash forward to like high school, I'm getting out of high school and I was like, man, what's the next step? And Jojo just wrote really incredible songs. And we always jammed together. Like all of us would just like, you know, go out to the, to these dudes, Noah, uh, Noah's house. And we go jam in the barn out in the country with like all these instruments. And, and when I got out of high school, I was like, fuck it. We need to like make this thing a thing. So yeah, the medium Troy days were great. We went on the fucking warp tour and it was hella fun. <laughs> You, you turned down several independent label offers, or maybe you didn't, but Medium Troy did, and they chose instead to bring a businessman from L.A. in named Daniel Fishman to manage the band, and he yeah. lent the money to buy their own veggie oil short bus. I'm not sure. I don't know. In retrospect, if that was the move, but what, what, did you did you weigh in when you when those independent label offers were coming in? Like, we should do this, and they were like, nah, we got to, we got to do that. No, I was like, you know, like I always do. I'm like always in different things. So like while I was in Medium Troy, I was also still doing shows with like Nick as the Alliance. And then um, I was working with this rapper named Undermine and producing a lot of his music. And I had my own shit and like my own little group called Better Than Most with a few of my friends. And um, I was working with Planet Asia by that point as well. So like I was just kind of like I I just kind of let Jojo that was his baby, you know, like that. He was the he was the face of the shit. So he was the singer. I was drumming in the background and then sometimes, or then eventually like our keyboard player quit and I started playing keys in the group. Uh, but now I just let him handle all the business and shit. Uh, Cause I was doing that with all my other things. So I wanted him to just like do it and I let them make their decisions. And when I quit the group, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was because of some of the decisions they were making. I wasn't agreeing with, <laughs> but I mean, you're 19 years old. You're playing at warp tour. I mean, mm-hmm. were you losing your, you're just your mind where they're like are we talking like trashing hotel rooms or anything like just rock star nah. stories or it was pretty i mean no it was like the grimy rock star life because you know it's the warp tour so if you don't have like a big tour they don't hook you up with hotels or nothing so it's like if you don't have the big tour bus and a place to sleep like you're just you're just uh, slumming it so that's what we were doing it was like seven seven dudes and jojo's girlfriend all in a in a van in that van they were talking about and it was hella fun. I, I, you know, it's only something I'd want to do at like 19, 20 years old. <laughs> I definitely oh, yeah. wouldn't do that shit now. It was like, you know, days of no showering, 
just uh, taking acid and fucking floating around, and you know, we'd have to like carry. The, I'd have to like help carry the drum set. Luckily, at that point in, in the band, I was playing keys, so I only had to lug a keyboard. But like, I helped the drummer lug the shit. We would like park, you know, you'd these big ass fucking places. So you park the car somewhere, like you know, half a mile away from where y'all are performing, and we'd have to just bring everything. And, yeah, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun, and we got to like. Katy Perry was the big act that year and Jim Class Heroes and like the dude from Jim Class Heroes and Katy Perry were dating. And so we all got to like hang backstage with all the groups and kind of see that action. And um, it was hella fun, man. There were some wild times like uh, we're all hanging out like our DJ Connor J. He used to wear a we all just wear goofy shit because we were a bunch of hippie kids. And he had like some wizard cap, you know, like a big wizard hat, like this purple wizard hat. And we were all hanging out, like, eating before the shows. And, like, Katy Perry was there and, and her, her fucking, like, band. And they were all hella chill. And then comes time for her show. And her show was sponsored by MySpace. So every every time in her set, she had to, like, bring up MySpace in some way. You know, instead of just being like, everybody go check out MySpace. She, like, do a creative thing. And so she would she would call somebody out in the crowd and say they sent her a dick pic. And, <laughs> and she, she just, like, pointed to my buddy. We were all standing, like, I was smoking this big joint. And we're just standing watching Katy Perry perform in front of this huge crowd. And she just like points and she goes, that guy in the wizard hat sent me a dick pic on my space. And then the whole crowd just like turns around and looks at us. It was hilarious. That's funny. <laughs> it's it's especially more funny because she was a Christian artist when she first came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it didn't seem that way. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, you remember a guy named Kevin Lyman? Yeah. Yeah. He was the reason we uh, got on the warp tour because a uh, little Jewish connection we ended up going down or i didn't go down at the time i had some other ship of the group went down and did um and i don't know if it was a wedding for one of his family members or bar mitzvah or some shit but medium troy ended up playing that and uh kevin lyman was like you know y'all are tight you guys want to do a little little run on the warp tour or whatever yeah i don't i don't want to steal his thunder but he's got a, a new podcast called my warped life and he's he's trying to track down all the old musicians who went to warp tour and then he wants to interview them about their experiences wow. so Everyone's got a podcast now. That dude's 60 years old starting podcast. So That's take, wild. take that boomers. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got one. I don't know why y'all hating. Only way I'm living if I stack paper. Get your game up. I smooth paper. Mailman stamp with approval. Only difference I ain't handing it to you. If it ain't related to my payment, y'all calling back. I blow paper like the name was already stacked. Moving forward a little bit, man. Uh, the green tape came from you because you were at the time frustrated with MCs and you didn't want to put time into rappers anymore does does that frustration come from not being known not being taken seriously maybe it's hard to network or maybe you kind of still feel that way depending on the day yeah i mean it was more of like i i work quick you know what i mean and so it's like i don't i don't like working with people who are going to take six months to make one song or some shit like that and so probably at that time, when I first moved up to Portland, that was probably my frustration. It was just like, I got all these beats and I don't got enough rappers who actually like want to come through and fucking work. You know what I mean? Like there are some MCs I'd have to like go pick them up from their house and take them to the studio just to get them to record. And uh, it was just a big frustration, you know? Because it was like, man, I got the studio. I've got the music. Why am I picking you up to take you to you know things like that where it's like why am I calling you to force you to come over to my house to record like fuck this shit so yeah that was kind of the thing I was like I'm gonna make this beat tape you know I always love that Al Green album lay it down um I mean and so yeah I was just like fuck it I want to I want to flip this in a day and then Ilmac ended up coming over while I was working on it and he started writing songs and and then he he basically wrote that album like he wrote in like two days like I made all the beats in front of him I think he wrote like two or three songs that day. And then the next day we like knocked out the rest of it minus the features, obviously. But that's when me and Ilmac really linked up and we're like, damn, like me and him cooked up. Like I moved up to Portland in 2009, August, started working with like Tope and Ep about September. They brought over Ilmac. And then I remember like it was either October or November of 2009. And me and Ilmac did like 30 songs. He just kept coming over and we just were like, me and him work the same speed. You know, like by the time I'm done with the beat, he's done with his rap type of thing. So, yeah. So so what's the difference between someone 
like Ilmac and someone that you actually have to chauffeur over to your studio? Are, are these people, are they not hungry? Are they lazy? Do they not have business sense, common sense? Yeah. I mean, I think it's all the above. And you know what I like used to do in my career that I realized was like, I was uh, reflecting my shine onto other people and reflecting my ambition onto other people. And so just because this person was dope at rapping didn't mean they had the same ambition that I did to like take it to another level or even have the belief in themselves that they could take it to another level. It's like, that's why I like living in LA because people aren't out here bullshitting. People are like out here to, to make their careers and I don't have to do it. I don't have to fucking get the artwork together for you and set you up the music video and like basically be the label, which I ended up doing for some folks in Portland, not everybody, but And yeah, Ilmac was already like established in what he was doing. Like he got it. He had the confidence. He had the ambition and clearly was working um, and had been working for him. You know, like he was like kind of the top dude in Portland besides like the lifesavers um, and shit. So it's like uh, Sam people were running shit. So I think it's that. I think just people don't have that belief in themselves to that point or, you know, it's tough, bro. You know, it's like your family's not going to believe that you're going to make it as a rapper. And so it's like all that stuff can just start weighing on you. I, I was talking with Illa J and even though you guys are best friends and you've, you've created two albums together, he actually told me that he's like just now getting confident enough to start releasing music on a more consistent basis that the shadow of his brother still kind of looms over him. And he's just like, you know what? I can't change that. So I'm going to stop fighting it. And I think, you know, at 35 years old, I think he's, his output is going to be faster now than it's ever been. Yeah, definitely. Well, he, you know, he came out the gate, um, on a label you know so it's like he never luckily whether for good or bad had to do the independent grind in that sense you know what i mean it's like he always had a manager in some sort of label to help push his projects um and so i don't think he like um i think like that yeah it was kind of hard to wrap the head around like oh i can just like drop a song like i don't need this campaign i don't need the 12 inch single i don't need you know what i mean and so i think over time that's helped but yeah I mean, those are conversations me and him had when we first started linking up was just like, how do we make you your own, your own artist? You've, you've had countless hours chopping it up with him by now. Did you, have you ever figured out what Dilla did on the D'Angelo project since he didn't get any production credit? Just provided the vibes. <laughs> now there's a Dilla beat in, in, in one of, it's like the outro to one of the D'Angelo songs. I'm, I'm blanking on it right now, but no, nah, I mean, that's basically what I heard from various sources i think there's a dilla beat on the d'angelo album that's just kind of like an outro to one of the joints and then uh you know i think that he was just the vibe provider i don't know if he actually like played anything or what i don't know the full details so if if you were if you had like a mental roadblock and some and there was just an entity in your studio that created a vibe for you to finish an album you give them credit on your project i don't know <laughs> I don't know. I mean, so, if that's the case, like I should be given lost spoken credit on a lot of my albums. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Th- this might be a negative transition, but I did want to know what happened with Mellow Music Group because the last album that you released on there was the album that you felt best represented you, which was Napkins. Uh, mm-hmm. Was it not received as well as you wanted it to? What what brought what brought upon you leaving? Because like I've had on Eloquent, I've had on Nolan the Ninja, I've had on Chris Oric, I've had on Apollo Brown, and mm-hmm. everyone who's been on this podcast all have different reasons for leaving. You can only, like a label can only do so much for you. When I signed with them, I was also doing a whole album for an artist on Interscope. And I was doing Illa J's albums. And I just had a lot of shit going on. So I couldn't fully focus my time into like, it's not like I was out there doing shows or fully promoting like my solo music um, the way somebody else would who didn't have all the other shit going on that was going on. So um, I don't really fault mellow music for anything. You know, they put time and, and money into me and, and gave me a chance to release three albums. And, you know, it was a great time. I really don't have any regrets with it. Um, you know, it's like we all we're all trying, you know, so at least he took a chance. And so I'm thankful for that. And napkins just like the promotion was we just didn't drop it right. You know, it was like a little confusion on. Initially, I just wanted to put it out strictly on vinyl and not even have it on streaming services or anything. And so, like, the only way you could cop it is by buying the vinyl. And and they they just kind of got wishy-washy with that whole idea. And the, and I felt like the release just kind of got fumbled a bit. So that record just kind of went under the radar. It's, like, hard to find, too. It's not even, like, on Fat Beats with my other albums and shit. So 
Um, Dude, I love that. I'm a vinyl head, so I love that idea. And maybe you can do that with bongs fresh out the freezer or something. Or, uh, uh, oh, yeah, the bongs in the freezer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe because I don't know, man. I appreciate the, uh, the scarcity and, and the rarity of things like that. So I like that idea. Yeah, me too. But I think, you know, like, yeah. So it kind of got a little janky because uh, he they ended up putting it out um, on Bandcamp like a few weeks ahead of time for free to try to build hype and it just kind of negated the whole idea of like the only way you can hear this is on vinyl and and i had a bunch of like promo videos that i gave them and they were like ah this is too many videos and it was just a big miscommunication on on like how to promote that project but the people who heard it like a lot of people say it's their favorite solo record of mine which is dope it was cool man like again i have no like harsh feelings towards mellow because i also understand like a lot of the the stuff is um is on the artist you know what i mean it's not like this just is what it is so it's like i could have i could have tried to go out and do more shows or done this that and the third but i was making too much money doing other things so well if you if you need a rapper who wants to do a whole project who's on the short list currency rock marciano i have to do at least a pro- i have to do a project with currency at some point in my career otherwise i'm gonna feel real terrible about myself He's messing with Harry Fraud a little bit too much, if you ask me. <laughs> a little bit too much. I agree. Uh, you know, I'll go, no comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, I fucked with, like, one of my favorite Currency songs is, is um, Golden Chrome, that Harry Fraud joint. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, who else is on that list? Can I suggest something? Sure. Because I've, I've talked with a lot of producers on this podcast. And you know who they say is unanimously the best in and out of the studio. I'm talking about will return a bar to you in an afternoon and is the nicest guy, Styles P. Interesting. I don't know if you guy if you guys styles will match, but if you want to deal with someone who's not an asshole and has a good work ethic, I'll throw that into the hat. I fuck with it. I take my, you know, I like get his the pharmacy for life shit. You know, I take the black seed oil, the Irish sea moss. B, C, and D pills, like, I fuck with them doing that healthy lifestyle stuff, so that would be tight. I would really love to do an album with Jadakiss. The, the list is crazy, you know, of people who I'd want to produce a whole project for. Like, I would love to do an album for Young Thug. That would be amazing. I mean, I really want to do an album with John Mayer, you know? Like, Currency and John Mayer are top of my list of, like, people who I'd want to produce a full project for. Oof, uh, that's dope, man. I love but, that. But, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it's like, every shit. But yeah, as far as rappers go, the list can go on and on. There's well, let's talk. Of- let's talk about the new record, though. So, what, what do people need to know about it? About weed is awesome. That's all you need to know. Awesome. Why awesome though? Why not great or amazing or cool? Because weed is awesome, man. It just sound it just rolled off the tongue. It felt good. It sounded good. So I just rolled with it. And uh yeah, it was this album was it was a fun one to do because like my last beat tapes like Avocado High and Plus Seats was more of me just like combing the archives. You know, I didn't make new beats for either of those projects. I just kind of like went through the, you know, the archives basically. And so that's what those are of like beats where I was like, I was saving them for some certain rapper and they and nobody ever rapped on them. So I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna put this on a tape. So Weed is Awesome is different because I created all the beats specifically for it. I basically like challenged myself. I was like, all right, I'm gonna make as many beats as I can in like three days. And even if they're like the hottest beats I've ever made, I'm not saving them for anybody. I'm putting them on this tape and the other difference is all these samples are cleared because they're all from track lib um track libs you know a dope website where you can get a bunch of fucking samples source a bunch of samples from different le- record labels over the years and artists and then you can clear them very easily for very cheap and so it was around november of last year and 
my buddy hit me up and was like, yeah, I can get you an account with, you know, like you should link with Tracklet basically. So I did that. And then yeah, basically it was like December. I don't even know, third or fourth to the sixth. And I just made like 30 beats. And then that became the project. When, when are you going to grow up and stop making weed music? I don't know. <laughs> you know, my girl, <laughs> I had a girlfriend in, in like a high school who said that she was like, you can't just like rap about weed and talk about weed all the time. And like, you know, fuck it. <laughs> I, I sure can. We just sold a bunch of records and people fucking love it. So I probably won't ever. I love smoking weed. Hey, it, wor- it works for Be Real. Wiz Khalifa. Exactly, that's what shit. I'm saying. It's like crazy to see where <laughs> weed's gone. Like when I was, you know, it was illegal when I was growing up. and We were getting busted and running from cops and all that shit. So it's pretty wild to see like the transition of it. And, uh, and it does suck that people are still locked up for it and people in other states it can still get arrested and all that dumb shit. So, yeah, I definitely understand the privilege I have, like, living in California in that it is legal for us. But, I mean, you know, it's like uh, Peter Tosh said, legalize it and I'll advertise it. So here we are. There you go, man. Who's who's still paying the bills on gravityhits.com? I don't know. Is that still up? <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, no. I don't even know how I could take that down. I didn't realize I was still up. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, Calvin, thanks for giving me another chance. I promise I will never bother you again unless you want me to. No, it's all good, man. Appreciate it. I'm definitely down to hop on whenever. And yeah, you know, make sure everybody goes and buys this beautiful picture disc from Cream Dream Records. Weed is awesome. It's going to be out the 15th of October, but the vinyl is available we only have 10 left of the hot box special first time in music industry history of a record label shipping weed to the consumer so you get the vinyl with the picture disc a bag of weed a lighter stickers rolling paper and a t-shirt pick that up before it's gone forever we only did 50 of those and there's only 10 left you can roll up smoke bump this project it's 20 beats beautiful beats with my brother my older brother Sally, doing scratches on everything i got voice notes from all my homies talking about the first time they smoked weed all like put throughout there there's some legendary i kind of just like went through all the acapellas over the years of, of artists i produced for and had my brother scratch them up so you got like planet asia illa j fat tony c plus fucking dang like a bunch of people's voices throughout the year so it's a cool project for me it's kind of special in that sense um that there's just a lot of history in it calvin appreciate you being here man yeah thank you bro i appreciate you